Well, it's my pleasure um, to have a conversation with Bill Whittla. And uh, we go back a long way. And the importance, I think, of this conversation is to find out what's behind um, Madison's athletic history, because no one has had the influence um, that Bill has had um, for over 40 years of, of exactly what the best of Madison athletics was. And I can attest to it because I started um, as a Gregory Heights kid watching the pros play. Um, Madison has always been a, a hotbed of baseball and we had little leagues all over. And then one Babe Ruth that massively had 12 teams and the major league club was always playing down below. And from the very beginning of me understanding varsity baseball, it was watching Bill Whittle's teams play. Um, I watched with my good friend Tom Wise, his older brother Rick, winning a state championship, Bill's first, the school's first uh, in the early 60s. Watched Keith Lamport bang one off the Mac Club. Then, as a junior in high school, this was my U.S. history teacher. So stunningly enough, I started thinking maybe being a history teacher and maybe coaching baseball was a good idea. And in hindsight, it was simply because this man influenced me so much in a positive way. Um, he then became the athletic director that hired me uh, as a 26-year-old to try to keep the ball rolling and Madison baseball legacy going. He also hired Jeff Erdman. So between us, we started in 1960 and Jeff went all the way through the end of the 20th century. Um, and in that 40 years, uh, Madison's athletic program for those four decades was dominated by, I think the beliefs and the character of one person, so Bill, it's it's great to be here. Oh, thank you. I, it's humbling to hear that, <laughs> and uh, I just uh, it scares me when I think of uh, all the good things that were dropped into my lap because of Madison, and uh, I didn't deserve it. Uh, I didn't apply for it. It just was given to me. <laughs> well, let's, let's kind of look at the story, and I think we got to start early. Um, with your home life in the Roosevelt area, uh, your family, and that earliest of education, just what are some of the key beliefs and values that you picked up living where you lived and with the parents that you had? Well, I was one of six kids, three, three boys and three girls. We lived on a, going back all the way to North Dakota, we lived on a homestead. And uh, my earliest memories are out there on the farm with a few chickens and a few pigs and a couple of cows. And no uh, indoor plumbing, it was all uh, uh, in wells and you lit, brought the water up and heated it on the stove and that was your drinking water and your shower bath water and everything. Uh, so it was a, a different world back in 36. But the Great Depression hit and we lost the farm. And uh, there's where uh, I spent, you know, I began, I think the earliest memories was seeing mom and dad uh, struggle. What are we gonna do with six kids homeless in North Dakota. Mm. And so it was, a, it was a rough time, but I, I realized how hard my folks worked and how much they loved me. And that was a sustaining factor in, uh, I think, in the whole family. But we, we had to leave the farm and that, that was a, you can look at it as a, I, I hate to tell this story because people hear it and think, oh, you think, woe is me, you poor soul, you had all these issues. No, I was blessed with all these issues. It wasn't, it wasn't a stumbling block, it was a stepping stone. That 
depression forced us to move. We moved down to Cullum, and the only place available to us was a parsonage that the Swedish Baptist Church had empty. And we, we moved six Finns into, or six kids, uh, two adults, eight, eight of us into that parsonage. And we were unchurched. We didn't, our old homestead was a place where we had Saturday night barn dances and uh, mom would come and lock the door and say, don't let anybody in. Uh, and they went down to the barn and had their party on Saturday night. So our lifestyle was really different. And here we are, we're dropped into Cullum, and now you're living in the church parsonage, and you're unchurched, and these Swedes are, you know, strict uh, Baptists. Uh, it, it's not going to work. But they, it was, a, again, it was just, a, they were the most wonderful people. They took us in. They didn't take advantage of our destitution or our needs. They gave, gave us help. But of course, with that help, we, part of our responsibility was to mom and the kids, we cleaned the church during the week. We trimmed the graves at the cemetery. Uh, Dad would dig the graves. Dad would work for the various farmers in the community during th uh, threshing season, preparing their crops, whatever. And uh, so it was, but I saw there the community aspect of life. Those farmers, when one person was sick, all of them knew it. And everybody chipped in and took care of whatever was needed to help that family back on its feet. When we needed help, they were there at the parsonage helping us. We learned what real Christianity was all about just by watching and living among them. And I think that that's where I got my the foundation of faith that I have that uh, I learned. <laughs> there was a Grandma Churnlin, uh she was, must have been 100 going on two, but she wore long robes and she gave us kids uh, a plot, potted plant every time we could quote a memory verse. And so every time I got into trouble, which was quite often, I'd get, go quote a memory verse to her and she'd give me a pot of plant, and I'd give it to mom, and I got out of the doghouse. Well, it was, uh, I learned a lot of scripture that way. And to this day, I've got a lot of memory of scripture in my head, that, but it was all memorized before I was 10 years old back there in Cullum. So, well, I thought I was taking advantage of her. She was really taking advantage of knowing that your mind is set and you hear these things. So uh, the strong teaching of the Ten Commandments in that community it was, was, uh, gave me a kind of a, what would you call it, a, a safeguard or guardrails for life. Mm -hmm. Instead of looking at the commandments as a bunch of don't, don't, don't things, I looked at them as do this and then you're going to be happy. And I think that's so true of, of the, the life. If you take those values, and I think every religion in the world, of the seven major religions, all of them have nine of the Ten Commandments in some form in them, right. those same teachings. And if you live according to those, you're going to have a happy life. But you start lying, cheating, and stealing, <laughs> you're going to have problems. Well, that's, that's pretty clear. And it's pretty bedrock stuff, but isn't it interesting when you when you think about our time right now that you're looking at adversity as an advantage, hard work is essential, and the sense of community and connectedness with other yeah. people being absolutely essential, um, and having some guardrails around us so we're not so free that we're ruining our own and others' lives. Um, yeah. Well, may that's... I add, add a point to that, to those people? I say they were such wonderful people. After years later, when we had the Vanport flood, we're out here in Oregon, and we were homeless again. They sent us a check from the church saying, we'd like you to use this money to come back to Cullum and live with us. 
But if you don't want to come back to column, use it any way you want to. So wait a minute, this is new. You, you went from losing your farm to living in Vanport and then losing your home in Vanport during the flood? Yeah. Well, that's what I have such a, a hard time nowadays with all of the giveaway programs. I'm in favor of, of charity. I think, I think I need to be at the head of the line when it comes to giving to help the poor. But dad lost the, the homestead. He lost the van, in the Vanport flood. Before he died at age 70, he owned his own home in St. John's. But it, he took whatever job he could get. And when he died, he was 70 years old, on, uh, up on top of a boxcar at Mr. Steel with a blowtorch cutting the thing up. And he had a cerebral stroke. Well, uh, you work. You know, and he didn't have excuses. You think at 70, you'd say, well, let the state take care of me. Or when you, the Vanport flood, six kids. The second time around, I think, how many dads left their families and said, I'm out of here. Let somebody else take care of the family. Let them live on food stamps, etc." I admired my dad so much because he only had a fifth grade education education, but he, he always had a job. And well, well it's, I think it's important you know, to, to point out that, that hard work, earning your own self-respect, yeah. and not making excuses, um, trying to make it, uh, and, and learn from your own mistakes and move forward. <laughs> These are some foundational thoughts that are pretty important for all of us to consider. Yeah. How about high school when you know it's kind of that time where maybe the lessons of your past are challenged a little bit where maybe your parents don't become um, the main voice you're hearing you're listening to your peers yeah. your teachers coaches a little bit more can you tell us about your high school experience at Roosevelt well when we moved into St. John's at Roosevelt had the reputation of being a tough school. St. John's was a tough part of town. People, you know, it wasn't the citadel of learning <laughs> in the eyes of most people. But there were wonderful people out there. And there were some, we had some wonderful teachers and coaches. And uh, when I got there, uh, let's see, where do I want to start with this? Uh, when I went in, got into Roosevelt, I was kind of a misfit, and I ended up that way probably. And I've always been somewhat of a misfit in the social realm. When we in Colum, those Swedes taught us, uh, there's, their interpretation of scripture was, you don't dance, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't swear. And so when I went to Roosevelt, social life was centered around dancing, movies. Oh, we couldn't go to movies. When they showed movies in class, I had to go sit in the hall. It even if it was an educational film, and we didn't make that distinction. But, you know, when people say, well, you poor, you know, it had to warp your personality for life. Well, it did. That explained some things, I suppose. But I don't think it hurt me. You have to learn to stand up for what you believe. And even though I was, you know, I didn't, I thought that was over the top, that I didn't need to do that. And I, <laughs> I showed a lot of films in my classes over the years mm -hmm. as a teacher. I can remember <laughs> a few. <laughs> but the same token, uh, you don't have to, uh, I bought, bought into the lifestyle of alcohol was out, uh, smoking was out. And that was a blessing to me. And when I, it didn't become a, an issue at school. But I had this, I spotted this beautiful girl when I was in the eighth grade and entering Madison. She was a blue eyed blonde with cur naturally curly hair. And she went to a neighboring church. And I got a date with her and the two church groups got together. 
we went on a hayride for Halloween. So I, you know, I was on top of the mountain going, going out with her. Well, I got to Roosevelt before any, I knew what was happening. She was dating a junior who was the star football, basketball, and baseball player. And so I was a low man on the totem pole. Yeah, it's tough competition. And uh, I knew, and of course, you know, my little boyhood ideas, I thought, well, if that's what it takes, if I have to be a good athlete to catch her, I'll be a good athlete. And I worked harder at baseball and basketball, and eventually I, I made the teams. But, uh, and four years later, I got her. But, but it was a long wait. <laughs> and I can't say I enjoyed that. No. Well, some things are worth <laughs> waiting for. And you well, were motivated uh, in sports a little bit more as a result of that. Oh, well, yes, yeah. Every time I, as a sophomore, I was pitching on the varsity, and uh, she was at all the games, and her boyfriend was playing shortstop. We were second in state as a, when I was a sophomore. So there was this constant, it's kind of hard to pitch when your mind is looking at a hitter and looking at somebody in the stands. But uh, you learn to do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell us a little, now, is it, is it true um, that you set a record in the state basketball tournament? Oh, yes, yeah. We, we won the, our junior year, a little background, our junior year, that we took five team, five people off the JV team moved up to varsity, and we qualified for the state tournament. We were co-city champions with Cleveland and uh, went to state tournament and lost two in a row. The next year, we won the city championship and went, and we ended up fourth in state. But I made myself known by committing 19 fouls in four games. <laughs> so so is it I safe? was a hatchet man. It, it was, it's safe to say you played pretty hard. Well. It, what happened was our, we, I was the slow guard, I was the point guard, and the captain of the team. But the other guard, was Richie Curtis, was very quick. And uh, I had a quick first step, but I, I was a foot race down the floor, I wasn't that quick. I was a slow boat. Anyway, uh, he got hurt, and we full court pressed a lot. And so when he was hurt, I took on the other team's best guard, the fastest guard, and you know it was a, the rabbit and the hare, mm -hmm. <laughs> or the turtle and the hare. I was chasing this, so I had to grab and hold and do everything I could to, to keep up. But, uh, but I, I still say today I couldn't foul out of a game, the way the referees call it now and the way they called it then. Ah, oh. uh, you know. If you touch somebody, then it was a non-contact game. Now, <laughs> whoo. Uh, as, as an athlete, was there a coach that influenced you or ended up having a, a key role yeah. in, in your future life? Yeah, that, that basketball coach was also my baseball coach, Marv mm -hmm. Rasmussen. And uh, he had been a bomber pilot flying over Germany mm. uh, at the end of the war. and, and he, finished his college and came to Roosevelt as a head coach. And I tell that because you need to realize what I'm gonna tell you about him. Uh, these people had been in war. They'd seen life and death. And here's some snotty nosed little <laughs> high schoolers telling them, I don't believe what you're saying, you know, or I, I'm not gonna to listen to what you want. And uh, they, they were more apt to do some direct counseling rather than pat you on the back and tell you it's right. going to be OK. But one day we were in the hall, a uh, group of us athletes talking and during the lunch hour. And he happened to walk by, and he stopped to do a little counseling himself. He asked us, he went around the room or around the circle, where are you going to go to college? What are you going to study? When he got to me, he said, where, where are you going to go to college? And I said, I'm not going. <laughs> it was like turning on the light switch. He grabbed a hold of me and shoved me up against the wall. And he was a big man, 6'4". 
and his face was red. He just, I thought he was going to beat me up right there. But he said, you're going to go to college. You're going to have a scholarship. And the next time I ask you that question, I want an intelligent answer. Don't give me some smart, I'm not gone. And so a couple of weeks later, he called me in and said, uh, where are you going to go to college? And what are you going to study? And I said, well, I've decided I'm going to be a coach like you. <laughs> I wasn't a fool. <laughs> and I, I meant it. The influence he had on me was he could, have, he could have put that off and said, go see the counselor. They'll talk to you. And I'm not opposed to one minute to a, the wonderful counselors we have that are prepared to help prepare you for college and so on. But as a teenager, I could care less what some old, and quote, I'm sorry, but that's a, the image I had. This old person telling me to do this and do that. What do they know about professional baseball? I'm going to be a baseball player. I'm not going to, you know, I was stupid. But because he told me he wanted an answer, I listened. And when he talked to me about considering that maybe baseball won't be there when you want it, maybe you won't make the, ba the bigs. And I had reason to think it, you know, up, that was my senior year. And I had, my sophomore year, I had won the game in the state tournament and the scouts were beginning to watch me and send me Christmas cards. And, but they had the, two of the guys that signed in the, out of that tournament, Eddie Ernest from the Dallas and Terry Zimmerman from Milwaukee. Suppose they got, one of them got 80,000 and the other 60,000. Well, in 1952, it's that a, was a big chunk of money. It's a fortune. And it was the bonus baby era. But then the next year, they changed the rule. and You couldn't go to the major leagues. They couldn't give you more than $4,000. If they did, they had to take you on the major league roster. So now my choices were, even if I happened to be good enough my senior year, the most I could hope for was 4000 Well, a sco college scholarship was worth that. Mm. And, you know, I, the choice has changed. And, uh, but he was reasonable, reasoned with me, said, at least consider it, you know. And of course, I was enamored. I, uh, he was a hero. I, okay, if he says I should be a teacher, I'm going to be a teacher. But it, it speaks to kind of the, the influence that a coach can have. It's, and it's different. I, you know, I was a classroom teacher, too, all my life. But you don't, you don't kind of crack through the plow pan of a young man or woman that is an athlete's um, brain quite as effectively as that extra influence that coaching and teaching has yeah. put the two together. Well, it's true th throughout the curriculum. I have, I have students who, uh, I have daughters who talk about Janice Shukart. She, she motivated them to go on to college to right. become English teachers. You know, it, it isn't, it's a different for every student. And uh, we all have a different role that we're seeing in a different light by different students. We use it, <laughs> capitalize on it. Well, before we leave high school, just one thing. I, I'd like you to talk about your senior year as a Roosevelt athlete and as a state champion and just quite frankly as the ace pitcher of the state champion. So when you came to Madison, you already knew what it took as a player and you'd already experienced what it took and how valuable it was. Can you just tell us a little about your senior pitching season? Well, uh, the, uh, I'll go back to my sophomore year. I, I pitched on varsity and had a good, good year. We were second in state. My next year, I won one game and lost five. And uh, I was an honorable mention to all city as a sophomore. As a junior, I was nothing. Mm. Uh, we didn't win anything. As a senior, 
we won the city championship, and uh, uh, I hit 483, I think, was batting cleanup on that team, and uh, we beat Albany three to nothing in the state final, and uh, we had, it was a team that, on on paper, our junior year, my junior year, it looked like we had the horses. Mm -hmm. But there was a disconnect. The team was divided. Nobody trusted anyone. Mm. And it was a, just a shambles. And, uh, I, I learned right there, team chemistry is really an important thing. Not that I adopted it at the time, but I recognized that, hey, we're a lot better than this. But right. it wasn't happening. And it was because of the outside influences that were allowed to take over the team. But in June, the first part of June, we we won the state championship. I think I pitched, we had three games, I pitched, th we had four games, I pitched three of them, and uh, we won those. Then I pitched for Norgan's Beavers during the summer in the semi-pro league, which was a, a real a big step up for me. Because usually you go play Legion ball, but I, the semi-pro team uh, was managed by a guy that was a big shot out at Roosevelt, but Bill Botler Sr. And it was Norgan's Beavers. They were connected with the Portland Beavers in a, just as a sponsor thing. But we played in that summer semi-pro ABC state championship tournament. And I was pretty proud of that. that uh, I got to pitch three games at that tournament. I, and uh, I had three shutouts, well, two shutouts. In the championship, I won two to one over Oregon City. They scored one on earned run. So I had three games without an earned run. And again, if the pros were, if the bonus rule hadn't been there, I might have collected some money. But with the bonus rule, I was, you know, well, we'll give you 4,000 and send you over here. <laughs> but that's not, wasn't a wise thing to do. So uh, I went on to, Port to Portland U and snapped my shoulder out, and that was the end of baseball. <laughs> what, what, what year did that happen? At the beginning of my sophomore year. I, I threw too much. In, in high school, I pitched. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one week, and started on Monday the next week. And then in the, in the ABC semi-pro tournament, this, in those days, uh, managers didn't think about, you know, have you had enough rest of his? If they said, uh, we've had such and such tomorrow, you're pitching. He said, my arm is dropped dead. I just pitched, I had one game, it's just one day rest. Are you a coward? You're afraid to pitch? Oh. You know, they, that oh. was a, you were a commodity. And that carried through to Portland. You, so you were throwing on one day's rest? Some of the time, yeah. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then you'd get two days off and throw again. Uh, on Monday, my arm puffed, forearm puffed up like a goose egg in my forearm. They took me down to Beaver Stadium to tip Bird, and he massaged the thing out. And, told him that, you know, scolded him a bit, that he said that your muscles need to have a day to, two days at least to come back to normal, and then they need another day to re recoup. You should be pitching on four days rest. But in the hubbub to get to the state playoffs, I, you pitch when you... <laughs> right. And I, I'm not, I don't blame my coaches. I wanted to pitch if I felt, you know, if we had a game, the most fun was to be pitching. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's a good look at what brings us to the beginning of your career.